major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, it's Thursday, September 23rd. Thanks for joining us. I'm John Carroll in for Maya Tribulsi. It is a decision many have been waiting for, a CDC panel approving the Pfizer COVID-19 booster shots for those 65 and older. Also tonight, those living in nursing homes and anyone over the age of 18 with underlying health conditions are good to go. KPBS reporter M.G. Perez has more on the local impact. 81-year-old Dennis Dooley now qualifies for a third dose of the Pfizer vaccine. I need all these protections that they're offering through medication. So I had the vaccination and I'll have the booster also. Dooley comes to the Serving Seniors Center downtown every weekday to pick up his meals. Senior citizens who come here are required to show proof of vaccination. 68-year-old Macy Turley is vaccinated and ready for his booster shot. I feel that's good because we do need our immune system strengthening. I think a booster shot would be better for us. And you're diabetic? Yes, I am. So that puts you in a special category, yes, yeah. what? The CDC also authorized boosters for the elderly living in nursing homes and anyone over the age of 18 with underlying health conditions. The fact is thousands of San Diegans have already gotten COVID booster shots even before the CDC announcement. In the true spirit of community, those boosters have been available at neighborhood locations across the county. Mostly at pharmacies like CVS. According to county health department numbers, more than 13,000 third doses have been given at CVS stores, intended for a very specific population of people with seriously compromised immune systems. A statement from a CVS health spokesperson says, we're fully prepared to meet any increase in demand, resulting from full FDA approval of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and expected regulatory approval of the vaccine for booster shots and children aged 5 to 11 years this fall. We've administered more than 34 million COVID-19 vaccines across the country and immediately began offering third doses to immunocompromised individuals when authorized to do so. Family Health Centers of San Diego has waited for the CDC approval before offering COVID boosters. And experts warn people to make sure they are eligible before getting the extra shot. Vaccine adverse events are extremely rare, but if something bad was to happen, you as the patient or the person giving you the vaccine is really not covered because they're not really following published guidelines. So you're a little bit out on a limb there. Dennis Dooley is eligible and ready. He plans to meet with his social worker tomorrow to schedule an appointment. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. Health officials say getting the unvaccinated their first shots remains the top priority. In San Diego County, just over 78% of those eligible are fully vaccinated. For the latest on the pandemic and resources, check out the Tracking COVID-19 section at kpbs.org. You can get there by clicking the link on our homepage. It's a first-of-its-kind law in the country, a move to get so-called ghost guns off the streets of San Diego. Today, Mayor Todd Gloria signed the law that had its beginnings back in April when a gunman opened fire in the gas lamp with deadly results. There's, a, there's an approved or there's a veto. I can assure you I'll be signing on the approved line and let me do that right now, okay? With council member Marty Von Wilpert and gun safety advocates looking on, Mayor Todd Gloria signed an ordinance meant to crack down on ghost guns. The name of the new law is ENUF, E-N-U-F, Eliminate Unserialized, Untraceable Firearms. Von Wilpert began working on the ordinance not long after a mass shooting in the gas lamp quarter back in April. A man who was legally prohibited from owning a gun was able to commit this crime kill a fellow San Diegan and injure others because he got a ghost gun. The incident motivated Von Wilpert to ask San Diego police to assess how big a problem ghost guns are in the city. 
The results were eye-opening, a problem that's bad and getting worse. Police department data shows there's been a 169% increase in the first quarter of this year in the amount of ghost guns used to commit crime in the city, with ghost guns accounting for more than 25% of the more than 500 illegal guns confiscated this year. So today we are taking action to close the ghost gun loophole, which is, allows people who cannot safely possess a firearm to obtain them without a background check, going around all of our gun safety laws. People can still buy kits to make ghost guns on the internet, and it's unclear how the law will impact those sales. The law goes into effect on October 14th. Mayor Gloria said today he is installing new protected bike lanes on a deadly road that cuts through Balboa Park. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen has more. Pershing Drive was the site of two fatal collisions over the past two months. The most recent crash last Saturday killed 35-year-old Jonathan Sepulveda, who was riding scooters with his family. In July, 57-year-old Laura Shin was also killed by another driver while biking on the same stretch of the same road. Gloria ordered the installation of temporary protected bike lanes on Pershing Drive by early next month. Plans to add a permanent separated bike path to the road have been on the books for nearly a decade, but they've been delayed until 2024. Gloria said in a statement, Traveling around our city without a car should not be life-threatening. I will continue to work to make active transportation safe for all residents in all neighborhoods. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. A top U.S. special envoy to Haiti has resigned, criticizing what he calls the inhumane, counterproductive decision to deport thousands of Haitian refugees from the U.S.-Mexico border. For days now, thousands of migrants, mostly from Haiti, have camped along the Texas border waiting to get processed. Reporter Camila Bernal has an update. The water's now high, but Haitian immigrants continue to cross. They say the situation is bad. The number of migrants peaked at over 14,000. But Border Patrol agents say they began to notice the increase in Haitian immigrants this summer. They asked for extra resources to more rapidly process migrants as far back as June and say they did not get it. I've been telling the administration since uh, the transition team since December 11th of last year that there are folks that are getting the impression that this border is going to be open. Now an investigation after video from Al Jazeera of Border Patrol agents on horse patrol appear to show them aggressively confronting migrants. We feel those images are horrible and horrific. We would no longer be using horses in Del Rio. Uh, so that is something, a policy change that has been made in response. And while many in the U.S. remain divided over how to handle the influx of migrants, Deportation flights to Haiti continue. The U.S. Special Envoy for Haiti handing his resignation to the Secretary of State, saying he will not be associated with the United States' inhumane, counterproductive decision to deport thousands of Haitian refugees. It's very clear that there are a lot of things that uh, many of us would have liked to have seen happen differently. Camila Bernal, KPBS News. Governor Newsom today signed the largest climate package in state history to the tune of $15 billion. He did it at the site of the massive KNP complex wildfire in Sequoia National Park. The legislation tackles a wide variety of climate issues from fire prevention to drought concerns to sea level rise. I'm optimistic about what this nation can do, what the world can do, certainly about what California can do. This simultaneous responsibility, not just crisis. Address the issues head on, more suppression, more wildfire prevention, more technology, more personnel, more support. And it's worth noting high school and college students will be rallying tomorrow on the issue of climate change. Events will take place at various locations, including the UC San Diego campus and the county administration building at one in the afternoon. We are cooling off a little bit. We've had a lot of heat advisories over the past week, but the good news is things are getting a little more bearable with us for some rainfall. 
That's the extra clouds that we've got in place. Some mountain showers certainly possible, and this pattern is going to continue in towards the weekend. So the next couple of days here really not turning out to be too bad, but do watch out for that shower or thunderstorm threat. You could find it in Mount Laguna. Temperatures falling into the upper 50s there, but 66 for the city. And as you venture north, Oceanside holding on to the upper 50s. But the story is this upper level low that's hanging on here, bringing some moisture into parts of southern Arizona and including here around southern California. It's not a lot of wet weather, but there is that chance for a few mountain showers and thunderstorms as we head through tomorrow. So we'll find that again around places like Mount Laguna. Temperatures then in the mid 60s. City itself, though, 75 for that high. And look at Borrego Springs here. Maybe a shower to 91 for the afternoon. Not nearly as hot as we avoid those triple digits. Future cast shows we start off with the marine layer here towards the coast. But moving through time, we're going to watch some of those showers, thunderstorms try to blister in every now and then over the mountains. And that's as we go into tomorrow evening, uh, tomorrow afternoon, I should say, and through tomorrow evening, maybe even into tomorrow night. So we will have that activity out there in place. That's because of this upper level low, which still holds on for the weekend. So not a lot of wet weather, but at least the chance for some of those showers and thunderstorms getting into Saturday. Coastal conditions here next couple of days staying in the mid 70s. We do have some of those extra clouds around and we're noticing that not just at the coast, but also our inland communities too that are dealing with some of those extra clouds. But it does get brighter towards the end of the weekend highs, then venturing back into the upper 70s. So falling off a little bit mountain locations chance for rain actually holds on into the start of the weekend for us mid 60s, but we should be a little bit drier by Sunday, still staying fairly bright and holding on to the mid 60s and for desert locations could see that stray shower or thunderstorm as we get through tomorrow, but avoiding the triple digits until maybe Monday. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Melissa Constanzer. It was back to class today at UC San Diego. The first day of the fall quarter officially got underway this morning. For many, it's the first time on campus due to the pandemic. Officials say they're doing everything they can to limit COVID, including proof of vaccination, mask wearing, testing, even studying the sewage water for COVID results. California is now the first state to bar mega retailers from firing warehouse workers for missing quotas, quotas that interfere with bathroom and rest breaks. The legislation stems from Amazon's drive to speed goods to consumers. Local Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez authored the bill. The law will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. Businesses will have 30 days to disclose production quotas. Holiday shoppers should get started now. That's the advice from the Port of Los Angeles. Reporter Chris Holmstrom shows us why. It's a bottleneck at the LA and Long Beach ports, and it's record breaking. 65 cargo ships are just sitting there, waiting to be unloaded. I think a traffic jam is the right way to think about it. Ryan Peterson is the CEO of the global trade company Flexport. He says during the pandemic, there has been an increase in consumer spending. You tie that with a shortage of trucks, drivers, and full warehouses, and you get this. There's just too much volume coming into the port that the port uh, workers and the cranes and everything have been unable to handle that level of throughput, and it's created this backlog. Now containers are stacked up. It's taking trucks forever to get in. All those problems will create delays to everything from furniture to electronics to holiday toys. I think it's going to be really tight getting access to products for Christmas season coming up. It's going to be a really messy one for consumers trying to find that product. Uh, the famous example, nobody can get a PlayStation 5 right now, but you're seeing even much more mundane things. Peterson says the cargo in each ship is equal to about a billion dollars worth of merchandise. The latest stats show in 2020, the top five imports in our ports were furniture, auto parts, apparel, electronics, and plastics. Right now, we have several hundred Halloween costumes that we could sell, it, not right now, that are stuck in the harbor. Charlie Wu is the CEO of Mega Toys. He's been dealing with delays for months, delays that could cost his company millions of dollars. Because of the congestion, there's not enough merchandise to meet the consumer demand. And at the same time, the cost has gone up and a supplier. We have to absorb the cost because there's no way to estimate how much it costs, how much price has gone up and how much the price will continue to go up. As many restaurants ease back to full reopening, hopes are that a yearly tradition will draw more customers back. But as KPBS reporter Alexander Nguyen tells us, restaurants are still facing a staffing shortage. Restaurant week is back. 
With more than 100 participating restaurants spanning the county, Restaurant Week chairman Andy Bauman says it's a chance for people to expand their culinary horizons. He's also the owner of Tom Ham's Lighthouse on Shelter Island. If Restaurant Week is a way for somebody to get a discount to come see my location and become a fan of ours forever, you know, that, that is why we participate in Restaurant Week. You know, this is our 17th year. Participating restaurants will offer prefix menus ranging from $10 to $25 for lunch and $20 to $60 for dinner. One Door North in North Park, for example, is offering three courses for $40. With all the pivoting that restaurants have done in the past 18 months or so, owner Tammy Peel was worried about how to support her staff. She says just having Restaurant Week again is a welcome change. With Restaurant Week and the opening back up of restaurants, um, it's been great to have that worry um, alleviated. While many people are excited about eating out again, restaurant owners are asking people to be patient because they're still having a hard time hiring servers. Thank you. There are times where you walk in the door and you can see empty tables and we're not going to seat you. And, and, you know, that's just because we can't do it. The staffing shortage has hit the restaurant industry especially hard. Bauman says he's having a hard time hiring people for a variety of positions, such as dishwashers. Restaurant owners have increased wages, but some people aren't willing to go back to work just yet. While the dining experience won't be what many are used to pre-pandemic, owners says diners should cut their servers some slack and enjoy the experience. Alexander Wynn, KPPS News. Restaurant Week starts this Sunday and lasts through Sunday, October 3rd. For a list of participating restaurants, just visit our website, kpbs.org. The San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance has done something no other North American zoo has managed to do. Wildlife specialists have helped hatch an Egyptian vulture. That's an endangered carrion eater that travels between Europe and Africa. KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson takes us inside their exhibit. Daisy Rivas walks between large wired enclosures in a quiet area on the eastern edge of the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Hi guys, good morning. This off exhibit area is home to a pair of striking white vultures. The male with fluffy white plumage sits on a perch surveying Rivas. The female on the ground, but at a distance. They are such special vultures. They're the only tool using vultures. So they're very smart birds. They use rocks to break open ostrich eggs. Um, they take a lot of the different parts of the carcass that larger birds can't get to. So they just play a really important part um, in the ecosystem. Interaction like this is limited because Rivas wants the birds to keep their healthy distrust of people. In fact, much of the monitoring happens inside a shed out of the bird's sight. There's a cabinet with video screens that monitor all the enclosures. So we have the opportunity to look at a lot of the birds' behavior without disturbing them too much. So we actually have cameras on a lot of our nesting areas. So this is a great view of our nesting area for the breeding pair of Egyptian vultures. An elevated square box serves as a nest. The birds typically clear a flat, rocky area to lay an egg. Inside the plywood shelter, there is a barrier that can keep the eggs from falling. The nest is screened from a pair of territorial palm nut vultures that are in the next enclosure. But it's also good for them to not be able to see these guys um, when they're sitting so that they don't get distracted but they can see them anywhere else they're perching and they can uh, make sure they're protecting the area from the other birds nearby. The mating pair has done something not accomplished before in North America. They produced and fertilized an egg, which hatched earlier this year. Park's lead condor care specialist, Ron Webb, showed us the trailer where the endangered chick was puppet fed. Jamila, as she's been named, was brought to this feeding station in a small white bowl filled with snuggly animal hair. Those faint squeaks told keepers that she was hungry and ready to eat. We have a one-way one windows in here, so uh, as long as this light's on and this light's off, uh, she can't see us okay. and we can see her. The feedings started with a simple sock puppet and a pair of tweezers. Old world vultures tend to take more food directly from the parents' beaks. Um, they'll eat through regurgitation, but they also take little, little bits. So we do actually pick up pieces of food and, and hand it to the chick. As the bird grew, the sock puppet was replaced by a more realistic one that staff used to care for condor chicks. 
when they're young, it's easy. Um, when they get older, they start pulling on them and yinking, and it's like they do with a parent skin in the, in the nest box. That tiny tan chick is now fully fledged and a bit nervous with human visitors. Jamila grabs the fence and pumps her wings as if to let everyone know this is her territory. Her dark brown plumage, by the way, will eventually become white like her parents. The vulture's arrival is being cheered by international conservation groups. Yes, it is very welcome to have a broader network of zoos that have that species and can potentially provide um, birds for, for release programs. Stefan Oppel is a conservation scientist for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. He says more than half of the vulture's population has been lost to hunting, poison, and electrocution in the last 40 years. Captive breeding only happens in a handful of locations in Europe and Israel, and those efforts produce a small number of birds each year. The population continues falling in parts of Europe and Africa, but there are conservation successes. In southern France and in northern Spain and uh, on, the, on the Canary Islands, uh, intensive conservation programs have actually managed to reverse the fortune of the Egyptian vulture by working very closely with communities, by changing the way we build electricity infrastructure. Different types of bugs with calcium. And while it's tough to help correct the challenges the birds are facing in the wild half a world away, Rivas hopes the breeding effort in San Diego will grow here and expand to other North American zoos. She says that'll strengthen the species' chances for survival. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Saying thanks for your military service is nice enough, but the Padres today went a bit further for one local veteran. Check this out. They gave retired U.S. Marine Corps Gunnery Sergeant Paul McQuig a car. The payment-free 2021 Honda CRV is a thank you for his military service and his work with local military and veteran-related nonprofits. You hear about stories and so on and so forth of other guys, and they're happy for them and happy for their families that, they, that something like this would happen for them. Um, but when it happens for you, it's kind of like, wow, you know, um, what did I do to really deserve something as, you know, as great as this, some, as beneficial as this? McQuig served 20 years and received a Purple Heart. He was also honored with two combat action ribbons for his deployment in Turkey and Iraq and an Iraq campaign medal with four campaign stars. In hard times, music can soothe our worried minds and there's nothing quite like gospel music to uplift your spirit. So for our last installment of the KPBS Summer Music Series, we're hearing from San Diego's own Martin Luther King Jr. Community Choir. Hi, I'm Ken Anderson. I'm the director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Choir of San Diego, more commonly known as the MLK Choir. I also direct the Gospel Choir at UCSD. The community choir, other than singing, of course, as any choir does in concerts, we also have a goal of supporting and promoting the arts. So we provide scholarships for graduating high school seniors who are continuing exclusively in the visual and performing arts. From the Negro spirituals come rag, swing, jazz, blues, rock and roll, American country music, soul, pop, disco, you know, even on down to hip hop and rap. All of these styles, um, many of these styles came out of a style that came from the Negro spiritual. They all eventually find their ultimate roots back in the Negro spiritual.
one thing about it, uh, there's one style of music that comes from the Negro spiritual gospel. One thing about working with MLK Choir and UCSD Gospel Choir, it affords me an opportunity to work with a lot of singers, perhaps who would not be able to pass an audition to get into some of these other fine choirs. They get to become a part of a choir and develop and essentially become a fine choir themselves. I love that, uh, how gospel music affords a singer on any musical level, whatever your musicianship. joyful noise to be sure. You can find our full story on Martin Luther King Jr. Community Choir San Diego and all of tonight's stories on our website. You know it by now, kpbs.org. Thanks so much for joining us and have yourself a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. and by viewers like you. Thank you.